any social issue that we have in America today, pick any social issue that we have in the world today, can and will be solved by entrepreneurs if we allow them to. The number one benefit America offers is free enterprise. It's mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. And it's for you to be able to do it at whatever scale. I feel if we encourage more kids to want to go into entrepreneurship, if we encourage more universities, high schools, junior high schools, even elementary schools to start talking about entrepreneurship, kids are going to come up being inspired to saying, what problem can I solve? And if we do that, we're going to be okay. That we're trying to stay in the middle as much as possible because there's a lot that the left can learn from the right and there's a lot that the right can learn from the left. I balance those two out. If I go to someone's home and they say, we never watch Fox News, you have blind spots. You have blind spots. You have blind right. spots. And if I go to someone's house and they say, we never watch CNN, now you know that's fake news, you have blind spots. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. For all you newbies out there, we are rebirthing the public intellectual by hosting the greatest minds of our time. I am super grateful to be on site in Dallas, Texas at Valuetainment. We are talking to entrepreneur, author, the founder of PHP, People Helping People Agency, the fastest growing financial services company in America, also Valuetainment, the number one entrepreneurship channel on YouTube, Patrick Bet David. What's up? Not much. It's good to be on with you. <laughs> Thank you for How coming you on to the show. I'm, I'm so, so blessed to have you on. And you're a huge role model for me and so many others that are following their passions in life, figuring out how to become entrepreneurs in this world. And I, and this has, been, oh, this has been a long ride for you. You have a lot of videos online of your path, how you got to mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. are. And so I, I, I want to focus a lot more of our conversation on sort of the higher level capitalism, entrepreneurship sure. conversations. And you have had PHP going on strong for almost 10 years almost now. Almost 10 years. Yep. And you have interviewed amazing minds, Kevin Hart, uh, Magic Johnson, um, Michael Francese, right? Yes. Um, and those conversations have been you know in the multi millions of views on your channel and you constantly have content coming out about how to make business plans or how to sell you 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 love selling and i love selling too it's just so such an mm -hmm. important trait mm -hmm. for us to develop over time so i want us to talk about really this sort of w where we're at today with the sphere of entrepreneurship and capitalism because a lot of innovations in our world have have electricity being innovated, the uh, internet and computers being innovated, even running water and ubiquity and food and all these things that have just increased the, the standard of life and the quality of life. And so the idea of these things being not celebrated for some reason, the media is just straight up avoiding that, yeah. celebrating this type of stuff. Tell us about your synthesis in this moment. Yeah, so I'll give you two different perspectives on that. Yesterday I'm with Anthony Scaramucci, with Bernard Carrick, and with General McChrystal in New York. We're having talks about different things. And one of the questions I proposed to uh, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, and this is a good challenge for you, I said, look, a lot of people uh, who are pro-capitalist, they believe in uh, uh, entrepreneurship, they believe in business, they are concerned about a guy like Alex Jones being censored, right? And you get a lot of people that are being censored now, they shadow ban, whatever you want to call it, Prager, Jones, Milo, all these guys. Now, some people say this is valid. Some will say it makes no sense. Let them say whatever they want to talk about. I think the one challenge you face is the younger generation coming up like yourself who is concerned about the future of capitalism and entrepreneurship needs to consider creating a platform like a Facebook, a YouTube, a Twitter, uh, any of those things, a PayPal, but politically you may be on a complete opposite and that's pro-capitalism. So you're not going to be able to say, I'm going to censor this guy because I don't agree with you. I'm going to censor you because I don't like what you're saying. You know, it's like, I don't, you're too pro-capitalism. The younger generation watching this, let me put it to you this way. If there's ever been a time for you to be able to create a platform to compete with a YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, a PayPal, any of that stuff, today's the time. Because 
You know, Patreon, look what happened with Patreon recently, with what they're doing with Dave Rubin, Sam, Sam Harris, with Jordan Peterson. And these guys are lucky. Forget about it. I'm no longer, I think Sam Harris just got off of a, a Patreon and he said, moving forward, I want you to subscribe and donate to samharris.org forward slash, I think it's subscribe. I just gave him a plug here. But he says, I'm not doing Patreon. I'm going to do my own thing now. Jordan Peterson's thinking about doing his own thing. So anytime there's a major pushback, you are giving strength to the opposite side. Let me explain. Bush gave birth to Obama, okay? Obama gave birth to Trump. Now, whether either one wants to take credit for it, that's just kind of how things work. You push far right in America, we're going left. You push far left in America, we're going right. And generally, the whole idea is that we're trying to stay in the middle as much as possible because there's a lot that the left can learn from the right and there's a lot that the right can learn from the left. Now, having said that, let's set that part aside. The other side about, you said my synthesis, is I'm at Harvard Business School for the OPM program. I didn't go to Harvard Business School. I don't have a four-year or a two-year. This is simply a owner, president, management program that they have. You have to do minimum $10 million per year or higher. You go, there's about 140 students from 60 plus countries and we spend three and a half weeks together on campus. It's a great experience. And one of the days, 12 of us were chosen to get up and give our solution for the future. I was one of the presenters. My message was around education because of my challenges with the education system. And here's how I saw the solution. And the next thing you know, the next uh, presenter goes up and he says, here's the invention we've created. Uh, how would you like it if we could contact the mayor and predict an earthquake from happening and giving him a six-minute warning? What is that worth? So we're sitting there saying, wait, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Think about it if we could say in the next six minutes, a 6.8 Richter scale, you know, earthquake is about to hit your city, warning. Mayor, handle and make your decisions. You have six minutes to tell people to what? Evacuate, get out. Maybe we're going to save thousands of lives. What is a product like that worth? Then another guy gets up. He's an entrepreneur out of Africa, Lagos. He says, we have a water problem. Everybody around the world is concerned about water. Well, let me tell you what we've inv invented. Per $100 million, we have invented a plant, a machine, that through air creates water. And it can create upwards of 1 million gallons of water per day. What is that worth? And I'm just sitting there, I'm just wondering to myself. I'm like, you know, any social issue that we have in America today, pick any social issue that we have in the world today, can and will be solved by entrepreneurs if we allow them to. If you and I were to play a game, and let's just say we started a show, and by the way, this is not a bad idea for somebody to do this with their own YouTube channel. Say here's your show. <clears throat> you bring in five entrepreneurs, five thinkers. So say for instance, you bring myself, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Dave Rubin, uh, Ben Shapiro, or you know, a uh, Gary, a, a whoever, these entrepreneurs, these people you bring together. And you say, the game we're gonna play today is I'm gonna give you a problem. You guys got one hour to decide how we're gonna solve this problem. Okay, what's the problem? How are we gonna solve uh, the issue we're facing in Japan that has to do with X, Y, Z, okay? How are we gonna solve the problem we're facing in such and such city, Detroit, that has to do with this, okay? Here's a problem, you have one hour. Come up with a game plan. Put five in a room with the context we have, the resources we have, the creativity we have. Look what happens an hour later. In an hour later, we have to present it. This is what we would do. We would contact Joe. Joe knows this. I contacted Jack. Jack told me about this person. There's a technology that's currently being used in Brazil that's being, this is patent right now, level three patent. Da, 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 da. Here's what we would do to fix the issue in Detroit. Again, I feel if we encourage more kids to want to go into entrepreneurship, if we encourage more universities, high schools, junior high schools, even elementary schools to start talking about entrepreneurship, kids are going to come up being inspired to saying, what problem can I solve? And if we do that, we're going to be okay. Anything can be tackled by entrepreneurs. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Solving the world's biggest challenges and even putting together some of the greatest minds inside of rooms and just throwing problems at them and saying, all right, let's, white, let's whiteboard out different solutions and then let's roll with trying to execute those and see what sticks in society to solve these problems. I am 100% with you on inspiring the youth to care more about this. So 
let's touch on that. What you have three children. Mm -hmm. You're we see so many kids being born now into the information technology generation and into this exponentials generation across all of the different pressing fields, biotechnology, neurotechnology, artificial intelligence, blockchain and cryptocurrency, all of these different techs are exploding. So how do we maximize the potential of the young kids to potentially pursue entrepreneurship? You wrote the book, Drop Out and Get Schooled. And so what do you think about how we can do that? Well, so one, if, if you want to talk about the educational system, I, I think uh, uh, everything is changing Everything is changing so fast. When I tell you everything, the way we're communicating, the way we're doing anything, the highest paid YouTuber last year was a seven-year-old that made $22 million. Let me say this one more time. The highest YouTuber last year was a seven-year-old who made $22 million. You ought to put the picture of it on Forbes when they see this. This is more than PewDiePie, more than Logan Paul, more than Jake Paul, more than anybody. $22 million, a seven-year-old, right? And what is he doing? Reviewing toys with mom and dad. You think mom and dad thought this was going to be a $22 million passive income? <laughs> One of their videos has $1.5 billion. I mean, think about this life. $22 million, that's an MBA max contract, almost a max contract in the MBA. So what is that? So now imagine that kid going to school and having to listen to a teacher telling him how business doesn't work. Imagine trying to explain to that seven-year-old that creativity and all this other stuff, trying to put him in a box. I mean, that kid's gonna be like, why are you doing this to me? This, this is not fair, I don't like what you're doing to me right now, right? So I think there's gonna be a part of it where, with access to so much information, I think the educational system, in a way, is screwed. This is why. They are going to be forced to change. Force, it's not, and when I say force, I don't mean like a government force. This isn't like, hey, you better do it or else we're gonna come out with a new regulation and lobbyists are gonna go out there and make you come out with a new curriculum. Nope, I'm sitting with the former president of USC and we're there, he's raising $6 billion. He's a Greek fellow, it's an incredible guy and you know, whenever you're president of a university that big, your job is to learn how to raise money. That's really your strength. They raise, they bring people that are great at raising money. And he says, look, I'm a professional beggar. What do you want me to do? That's what I do for a living. So he's asking for $6 billion that they're raising. One and a half billion dollars of it goes, uh, a, a big number of it went to creating a campus, creating a uh, local campus that's 1.5 million square feet, it, 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 give or take, that is identical to the cafeteria out of Harry Potter, that is identical to the buildings out of Harry Potter. Think about that. Here's a school like USC. They're sitting there and they're saying, based on the research we're doing, kids are reading Harry Potter, they're studying Harry Potter, they're fans of Harry Potter. We can't get rid of what J.K. Rowling did with the most selling book in the history of mankind outside of the Bible. And what's going on over here? What is this man doing? What is going on with these kids? They want to go to a place like this. So they adapt. They weren't forced to do it. They adapted because, look, I want to go to a place that looks like Harry Potter's cafeteria. Great, we'll, we're willing to be creative. I think the educational system has to change. I don't think four years makes sense. Who came up with four years? Was it a four year strategic because it allows me to make money with you know the business side of it? I don't think the fact that colleges are not paying taxes on their sporting game, so the money they make from the sporting uh, game, the ticket they sell, they're not paying taxes on that. What does that have to do with education? The money they make on their returns and their accounts, they're not paying taxes on that. Why are they not paying taxes on that? There are so many incredible, if you want to start a business today to be a billionaire, go start a college. I mean, truly. Every tax benefit favors colleges and universities. No one's saying anything about it. It's just, hey, we're going to pay for it because traditionally this is what we've done. But there's a big blue ocean. If anybody's read Blue Ocean, go reread it again and find a way to crack the code for the educational system. There's so much opportunity. I think Udemy, Plural Site, Code Academy, I think this is just the beginning. We haven't seen anything yet. That's going to keep changing. But on the flip side of the coin with uh, uh, these kids, I don't think uh, educational system is going to have a lot of influence over five, six, seven year olds as much as they think because as long as YouTube is around, as long as you know these w platforms are around where my level of curiosity is going to allow me to go find how to X, Y, Z, whatever X, Y, Z is, I'm going to start saying, oh my gosh, like I, I can do this and I can go out there and figure out how to do this part. And, I can go figure out how to do that part. And what if I can build this? And what if I can build that? And then 
the kid is always going to compare the, the teacher on YouTube to the teacher in school, and the kid's going to say, I'm sorry, teacher in school. That, that person on that YouTube channel is just a better teacher than you are. I can't listen to you. I would much rather go watch three hours of YouTube videos on this person mm-hmm. that admire, I'm, I admire them than watching you. So that comparison is eventually going to drive them nuts. It's like a girlfriend <laughs> constantly being compared to the ex or boyfriend being compared to the ex. And no one likes that. Teachers are going to experience that. And eventually there's going to be a lot of friction. And after that friction, whenever we have friction, there is a solution always that comes afterwards. It's a lot of difficulty, but whether we like it or not, this is going to happen. It is going to happen, and the change will be forced by five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old. Guaranteed, <laughs> I see that happen next five to 15 years. Yeah, they're going crazy on the social platforms oh, yeah. right now. The, even children that are not yet birthed by their parents, their parents are making social accounts for their children. <laughs> this is going insane. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you're wondering, is that a good move, is that a bad move? But imagine you're like 14 years old and your mom gives your Instagram account, here son, here's your birthday present, 18,000 followers. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this since you were born. <laughs> right? Think about that. You're yeah. already an influence, <clears throat> influencer. So, uh, Pat, let's go again to, let's, let's explain this a little bit because I don't think so many people have a very global perspective on how things are working in other places and why the United States is such an incredibly fruitful place for entrepreneurship and capitalism. There are so many places around the world where there are structural violences in place that impede people from having economic degrees of freedom. And here we have it. So we need to celebrate that and move forward and help other places in the world enable their economic degrees of freedom so they can also prosper. Yeah, so the question is, you know, uh, given perspective, how do you give perspective to people that are here who have never seen it before, right? So yesterday I'm talking to General McChrystal, who is a four-star general. Like a four-star general to me, at any given time in the U.S. Army, you can only have 14 four-stars. So think about how many billionaires we have in the world. Say we have a few thousand billionaires, handful of billionaires. There are only 14 four-star generals in the U.S. Army. Mm. That's how big of a deal this is to be a four-star. I was in the Army for nearly three years. I never once met a one-star, let alone a four-star. Like four-star is unreal, right? So I asked him about his uh, story. His father was a two-star general. His grandfather's in the military as well, a leader, also an officer. His brothers all went to West Point. He went to West Point. He's one of four sons that I believe went to West Point, four or three that went to West Point. So in his family, they grew up reading Greek mythology, Greek leaders. Just a fascinating story, right? He wrote a book called Team of Teams, and he wrote another recent book called Leaders. And his perspective is different than some other generals. So it's interesting to find out about why he thinks the way he does. For him, he said something. He says, you know, he grew up in a family where what he knows is you know, being raised in a military family. His mom and dad said never did anything wrong, right? Never did anything wrong. He saw his mom and dad always doing the right thing. When they made a left turn, they signaled. They never winked and said nobody saw us do this. This is what he's telling me. Okay, so that perspective is coming from a perspective of what? Man, I got so lucky being born in a family like this because everybody else I hear their family, their families are flawed, issues, drugs, alcohol, divorce, separation, domestic violence, all these other things, you know, people are raised, oh my goodness, what's going on with this, right? That example to me is the same exact example of people who are born in America and they've never lived in another place and they don't know how bad other places is. Mm. And sometimes we forget. It's like the guy that's got a good father who bitches about his father and his friend, you know, he bitches about his father to his friends and his friend pulls him aside and says, listen, I wish my dad was alive. Mm -hmm. I wish, I said, please don't complain about your father anymore because it's so condescending to me because I wish my dad was sitting right here for me to have a five-minute conversation while tears are coming down his eyes and he's telling the story to his friend. And that's what a lot of Americans are doing today. They're talking about America is this, America is not really great, America is not really the best country. Who said we're the greatest country? We need to stop with this exceptionalism and, you know, uh, America on time. All these things that you hear about people that say that, but they've never lived in Iran. They've never lived in what's going on right now with France. Look at the streets of France right now, what socialism is doing. Look at what's going on, France. What's going on, what's going on in, uh, in Spain. Look what's taking place in some of these other countries. You know, look what's going on with people that are in Cuba. What's going on with people in North Korea? They don't know better. Some of these places, you don't even have access to satellite. 
You know, the part that I am optimistic about when I think about this is the following. I think, like for me, coming to America, I don't have a four-year, I don't have a two-year, and I don't come from a family of money. My parents got a divorce. My dad was a cashier at a 99-cent store. My mother relied a lot on welfare, and uh, so I joined the Army. One day I'm like, listen, I want to break from everybody. I'm going to the Army, and I go to the Army, and I stayed there for three years, 101st Airborne. I come out, I picked up discipline, I picked up focus, I picked yes. up camaraderie, those things from the military. Yes. I come out and I say, let me get this straight. You mean to tell me in America, if I get to work and I figure out a way to do something better, I'm allowed to make as much money as I can and build the life I want to build? Yes, let me test this. Let me test it out. To my friends who are graduating from USC, UCLA, they're making 60 grand a year. All of a sudden, I'm making 100. Then I'm making a quarter. Then I'm making a half. Then a mil. Then all of a sudden, we build a business. Then I raise money. Then Oscar De La Hoya is my business partner. Then you got uh, Gabriel Brenner, who's the first Mexican-born president, Mexican-born uh, professional sports owner in America that invests into our company, Adalaya Fund, a $2 billion fund. I'm the majority owner. You go to Crunchbase, you read it. Wow, this is really taking place. Wow, you're really making money. Wow, I can really push the envelope with YouTube and really scale this and build a platform and have a message that whether you like it or not, because I don't like this guy. You don't listen to it. I like this guy. You listen to it. You mean to tell me I can scale it this much? Yes. Unbelievable. Why aren't more people taking advantage of the biggest benefit that this country offers. It's like working for a company that says, when you work for a company, we give you a free membership to Equinox. You have this much money to spend for this. We give you scholarship to tow, go to leadership courses every year up to $3,000 as long as it's approved. And these are the seven things that you approve. You can go to a Tony Robbins deal. You can go to a leadership seminar USC. You can go to this thing by this where you can go to a leadership thing over here. These are all approved. As long as you take it and you go and we have to go with a partner from the company, we'll verify the benefits. We'll give you 401k benefits, we'll give you stock options, we'll give you all this. Say this company you work for offers these 10 benefits, but you never take advantage of these 10 benefits. Whose fault is it, the employer or the employer? It's the employee's fault. America, if it was a big country that offered all these benefits, mm -hmm. the number one benefit America offers is free enterprise. It's mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. And it's for you to be able to do it at whatever scale. A lot of people tell me and say, do you think everybody should be an entrepreneur? Absolutely. Do you think everybody can be an entrepreneur? Yes. Do you think everybody can build a billion dollar company? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a billion dollar company, but I believe anybody can build a side business making $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. I believe anybody can build an online business making two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month. I believe anybody can do something where once a week they work somewhere, they're making $500 a week. I think you can do that, and I think you ought to do that. And then on the flip side of it, if that's free market capitalism, free enterprise, freedom of assembly is another one that we don't necessarily have in all countries, but yeah. freedom of speech. Look what you're doing right now. You're creating yeah. content. You're sharing your opinion. Here's what I think. Here's what I believe. You bring the guest based on what you view as being brilliant minds to somebody else. I may be an absolute crazy guy, but to you, you may say, I like the way he thinks. Mm -hmm. I want to put him on my platform. Let's see what the viewers think about it. Mm -hmm. So on the, <clears throat> in the direction we're going with America uh, and, and how uh, the benefits this country offers, I think today you'll hear saying 90% of media is controlled by the left, right? You'll hear saying that CNN, MSNBC, NBC, you know, Washington Post, Time Magazine, LA Times, New York Times, you go through all of it. And then the right owns what? Let's say they own, you know, Fox News. And that's pretty much it. Maybe Washington T Times, but it's not as big. Maybe New York Post, but it's not New York Times. Maybe some of these other platforms, maybe the Breitbart's and all these, you know, Drudge Report and some of these things that's out there. Fine. But mainstream media is pushing so hard one agenda that the next 10 or 20 years, <laughs> when the other side of the media shows up, they can't get upset about it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is, what, this is what I'm thinking about. There's only so much I can push you until you push me back. Like, let's just say if I hit your knee right now, mm -hmm. first time you may react and say, I don't know what that was all about, but out of respect to my guests, I won't do anything, right? Second time I do it, you may say, Patrick, can you please stop that hurt? Third, fourth, fifth time. How many times can I do that? I can't do that too many times until you react. Yeah, yeah, so you're yeah, either going to hit me back or you're going to get up and say, I'm sorry, this is weird. I'm out of here. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to leave. As bad as the concerns may be from the capitalist standpoint, people that are worried about what's going to take place, 
I think this pushback is going to create the best innovators, the best capitalists, yeah, I think so too. the best entrepreneurs. I think the tide's going to turn in ways where they're going to say, what happened? And the message is going to be simple. You gave birth to it. Yeah. I really love how you illustrated this benefits card that every single uh, citizen of the United States is able to pursue, yet so few uh, actually end up pursuing it. And I think there's a lot of social um, pressures, the parents, the communities, the uh, the people in higher positions of clout, there's so much pressure on people saying, follow a path, a certain path, instead of make your own path, go and be an entrepreneur. It's not yet as celebrated as it could be, and hopefully with this new uprising in, uh, in, 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 in innovation and exponential technologies, that there will be more entrepreneurs more celebrated and now like you were explaining also with the with access to information technology at our fingertips anyone can more easily create gives a degree of freedom and we hope to see that around the world and we hope to provide people with those degrees of economic freedom around the world um, okay so that's a lot on the on the entrepreneurship and the capitalism side of things um, I want to take a take a transition to interviewing because this has been something that you've been picking up and it's been really fun watching you in your interviews. Um, how has this process been for you and what have been some of your most profound takeaways from interviewing? So it's so interesting, you know, I've been interviewing my entire life and what I mean by that is I've always been curious. So I always wanted to find out. So, you know, my family would say, you would make a good detective. Why? I'm just curious, but it's not that I want to be a detective. I'm trying to find stuff out, right? So when I was working in the mili- when I was in the military, I wanted to know, I wanted to learn. You're from Mississippi. What is it like being from Mississippi? Like you said, Sioux Falls, right? Mm-hmm. I had a couple of friends. I went to a wedding for a guy that was from North Dakota. And I would ask him, what is North Dakota like? Tell me about North Dakota. I'll never forget what religion he was. I'll never forget what the wedding was like. I'll never forget how he was like. His last name was Wilson, nicest guy in the world. He lost his virginity to his wife. He never drank with us. He never partied with us. How can you stay so disciplined? I was always curious with that character. My sergeants, my officers, I was always curious. So later on when I got out, I started working at Bally Total Fitness and I was selling memberships. But through selling memberships, instead of me sitting down with you and asking you, tell me some of your health goals that you have. Do you want to get cut up? Do you want to mm. lose weight? Do you want to increase energy? Do you want to put on muscles? What are some of your dreams and goals? And you would tell me, how important is it to you? All that stuff. Okay, that's easy, right? And then I would put a regi- you know, program together, put you together with personal trying to sell you membership, whatever it was. For me, I sat there and I said, if I have 30 minutes with you to sell a membership, this is what I want to know. I want to know what career path you took, what are the benefits, what are the pros, what are the cons, what do you like about it, what do you not like about it, what is the barrier to enter, what degree do I need, what kind of income potential does it have, what kind of lifestyle potential does it have, do you like it, do you not like it? I asked those questions and through that is how I ended up in the insurance industry, believe it or not. I would ask real estate agents all the time, what is it to be a real estate agent, give me the pros and cons. Uh, what do you like about it? Well, real estate agent, there's a lot of money to be in my market goes up, you make money, market goes down, you, you lose money every 10 years in real estate, you have a divorce, you know. And you learned how to build rapport with people really well. I did, I, because I, my favorite product in the world, some people like iPhones, some people like smartphones, some people like food, my favorite product in the world is people. Mm-hmm. Because no two is the same. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. so fascinating to yeah. learn about them. I mean, how can you not get excited about learning about people? Mm -hmm. I asked you a question when you came, I said, tell me about yourself. And you were kind enough and you kind of didn't want the attention to be on you, so you almost pushed back on the answer three times. But I said, I want to know about you. You're born what? You said October 10th, your birthday. Your parents, you're from Baku. You know, your mom and dad over there, your dad's over there, your mom's over here. Tell me about the schooling, why I dropped out nine, seven years ago or six years ago. I moved mm-hmm. to Silicon Valley, best decision I made. I was 19, you're 26 now. Mm-hmm. I want to know. I want yeah. to know how a person is. And so doing the interviews for me, one day we were like- Shout what? out right there, by the way. That is how you build relationships with people. This is a really important moment for people to remember that if you care, if you show the true, genuine love and care for asking people questions about who they are and what they care about in the world, what they want to build into the world, 
and if you can para if you can paraphrase and and show people that you actually listen and that you care that that sort of relationship building and like we are snowflakes in a sense no one's had the exact same stimuli that you've had in your entire uh, life. and I want to know about it so I, want, yeah. I mean I know my life I want to know your so life so much to know? learn yeah so much to learn right so from there then all of a sudden interviews came up and when we started doing these interviews, the, the people being interviewed, they're like, why do you know so much about me? Like yesterday I'm sitting with Bernard Carrick, former chairman, a former commissioner of NYPD and commissioner of correction, uh, NYPD correction. One of them was an $835 million budget. The other one was a $3.5 billion budget. This guy ends up going to prison. He gets hired by Bush to become the Homeland Security uh, head and oh. then 11 days later they find that he didn't pay taxes on his nanny for 14 months. And because of that, they put him in prison for three years. A couple other issues, but they put him in prison for three years, and he lost his entire reputation. Going back, telling his story at nine years old, my mother got shot and died because whatever she was doing back in the days. And I'm sitting, I'm like fascinated by this yeah. story. And he says to me, he says, how do you know the meeting I had with Bush right before that he landed back from Canada? I said, it's called research. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your story. You have an incredible story. And so I think there has to be a level of curiosity, especially if you like the product. If you like the product, which is people, and I like people. I mean, yeah. I look at people, whether I agree with you or not, some people ask me and they say, why would you sit with a Gloria Allred? Do you realize she's such a, you know, there's so many words to use for Gloria Allred. There's so many words to use to, for Jerry Springer. Why would you sit with Alex Jones on 9-11? Why would you sit with this other person, you know, Katie Hopkins? Left, right, middle, I don't care. I agree, I disagree with you. Criminal, not criminal, billionaire. Mm -hmm. I want to know because I think there's something to learn from everybody, good, yes. bad, or ugly. So it's that level of curiosity that makes these interviews interesting to me. Yeah, that's where I, I love. I love where you took that. That's that's right. A level of curiosity, and also I would like to ask you about this as well. Is you've built out this with this level of curiosity you've built out <coughs> a mental lattice that has a lot of different disciplines and life stories baked into it so when someone starts talking about what it's like to be low socioeconomic status or high or what it's like for them to uh, have grown up in a certain part of the world versus another part of the world you can vibe with people wherever they go and i we call with the polymaths, mm -hmm. one that has learned much. And so when you have that mental lattice, it helps you relate with people on a deeper level. And then also the emotional intelligence, the empathy, that side of things that you know how to, how to, how to be present with someone on an emotional level. So we usually smash those two things together and then you gain some sort of a really strong interviewing ability along with that curiosity so do you where, where do you what did you how do you feel about that sort of about your own mental lattice now being so multidisciplinary because you have had so many people that you've sat down with and asked I love how you said you love people that's your favorite product <laughs> so, it is hands down my favorite product so I, you know I think it probably you know uh, people tell me they say you know uh, memory how can I get a better memory Pay attention. Like, like when you're sitting with somebody, like if I, can, if I can get to a point where I'm sitting with you, no one exists around me, I'm paying attention. If I'm around you and I'm constantly worried about what happened, what's going on with this, what's going on with this, what's going on with that, my wife, my husband, my kids, my this, I'm a different place, I may be getting 10% of what you're saying versus if I can disconnect and just be present with you, I may be able to get 40, 50% of it, right? So. I want to be present when I'm sitting down with you. But to answer that question to you, I think it probably gives you an edge on knowing different rooms you can go enter and you know how to handle mm -hmm. topics and discussions that come up to be able to connect uh, and that helps with business. But uh, you, you, there's got to be the desire behind it. Like I can't force somebody to do that. I can show you the benefits of it and tell you here's the 10 benefits of you being curious and how it's going to selfishly help you. So in, in a way where you do this, you can advance in career 100% because if you mean to tell me you sit with your boss and you remember something about your boss that somebody else didn't remember, they're gonna be like, mm. boss is gonna say, wait a minute, how do you remember that about yeah. me? I like this guy, let me help this guy get promoted. What can I do to help you advance? People will remember those things. Yesterday was my friend Phil Heath's birthday. He's a seven time Astro Olympia. So hey, you know, call to him and a message to him saying, hey Phil, Happy birthday to you, man. You know, you're a champ, you've done amazing things. And even a simple birthday sometimes, we forget those phone calls have so much influence. 
-hmm. But yeah, I, again, mm -hmm. I'm sure it helps, but you, it's got to be important to you. It's got to matter to you to do it. If it's too, if it's too strategic, the opposition, the other person's going to realize that you're doing it with motives behind it. But if it comes from a sincere place, they won't know it's happening. It just kind of happens because it's sincere. As someone that has looked up to people that are entrepreneurs that care a lot about capitalism, that care a lot about interviewing other people that have an insatiable appetite for knowledge in our world, I am just I'm, I'm connecting with you on a new on a very new profound level for me too that I just I love the idea of, of people being so different and diverse and having a desire to 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 get to know them I'm, I'm happy that you're that you're you're making that really clear for us and I think if more people had that we would humanize each other more instead of the dehumanization that's going on around the world in many ways yeah, the dehumanization can lead to major problems. I have I, a quick segue here into, into how this relates to the future of society in general with automation and artificial intelligence, robotics, all these fields that are booming. What happens to human capital? Human capital will be needed. Uh, it'll be by industry by industry, case by case. It won't be every industry. A lot of industry is not going to necessarily need the human capital as much as we needed it before, right? I mean, you heard Elon Musk say the biggest thing we have to worry about is the fact that AI could be taking over everything, that in the future many jobs uh, may not be there and governments may need to support their, what do you call it, you know, the, the populace because how are they going to get some income? Now, I don't know if we're going to go that direction or not. I don't know what's going to happen with that. But I will tell you that, like today, affiliate marketing was not around 20 years ago, at least not at the level as today, right? YouTubers was not around 20 years ago. And there are people that make money today that are YouTubers, right? Bloggers was not around 20 years ago. There wasn't people doing blogs and getting sponsorships. People doing podcasts nowadays, making a half a million dollars a year as a podcaster. Yeah, I met a man who was an attorney making 200 grand a year. He drops being an uh, attorney, goes and becomes a podcaster because he's a diehard Walt Disney fan, Disney World fan. He's making a half a million dollars a year from sponsorships. All he ever talks about is Disney, and he's no longer an attorney. So there's, there's going to be so many new ways to make money. Mm -hmm. I think the one skill set that's going to be very, very critical uh, is learning how to adapt. <clears throat> and, and when I say adapt, yeah. I mean adapt quickly. And it's going to kind of hurt the older community because typically the older community doesn't adapt that quickly. They go back to trying to change people like, you know, I don't understand these millennials. They're just so weird. They're lazy. I, I call him. He doesn't pick up. I text him. He responds back. Why don't you call me? I want to hear your voice. You have to adapt. They're not going to adapt to you. You have to adapt to them. You don't know what it is to go to school with a cell phone at nine years old. Mm -hmm. You don't know it. They know it. You and I didn't get a cell phone. Say the uh, people that my, my age, maybe at 21, first time I got a cell phone, I was 21. I was listening to Walkman until mm -hmm. I was 20. I got my first CD player at 21. I didn't come from money, but that's the adjustment. We used to pull our windows up, right? Today it's all you know, automatic. But you don't even think about cars that are manual for the window. You're, you know and everything is machine. So, that's not making that big of a difference in our lives. I think the skill is going to be adapting and actually sitting down and asking yourself the question. For instance, I'm in the life insurance business. I, you know, I started off in the financial industry. And then at one point, I had to decide what part of it I wanted to go to. I started off with Morgan Stanley Dean with her day before 9-11. So I got my Series 766, 3126 Life and Health, right? And then all of a sudden, during that time, you started seeing short trade, Scott trade, E-Trade. You know, all these, do it yourself, do it yourself, do it yourself, mm -hmm. $9.99 a trade. And if you do more than 100 trades a month, $2.99 a trade. And so everything was about, you can buy the stocks yourself. You no longer need a stockbroker. So I said, first of all, why would I go that route of being a stockbroker? If every time I'm going to be compared to a machine, and let's just say they come up with the right mm -hmm. predictive analytics that says, don't buy the stock, buy the stock based on these, why am I needed? My brain's never going to be smarter than a computer that has access to data that can do math within a second, and I can do complex math, and I'm pretty good at math. So maybe being a stockbroker is not the route to go. Then I looked at the other side, I said bonds. Okay, I don't know, bonds is going to be tied to the same thing. 
Money under management, maybe it's not a bad idea to do money under management. Okay, I'm gonna do that 2%, you know, anywhere between half a percent to 2% different, depending on the market you're dealing with. But then I looked at PNC auto insurance. They passed the law, you have to have auto insurance or else, you know, you're gonna get a ticket. So at that moment, I no longer needed an auto insurance agent. We used to buy auto insurance 15 years ago and I sat with a person, Mercury Auto Insurance, I'd buy it from you. I haven't met my most last auto insurance agent for the last 15 years because I don't need it today, it's a machine. I call, I set it up. So auto insurance went out of business. But life insurance, why did I stay in the life insurance business? Because no one buys life insurance. Everybody sold life insurance. And life insurance is never gonna be a law for you to have life insurance. Mm-hmm. It's always gonna be, I have to convince you to yes. buy life insurance. You don't wake up in the morning saying, honey, I feel like buying life insurance today. No one does that. You gotta so, be educated on the importance of it. Yes, and it's an emotional sale. Mm-hmm. Auto insurance is a logical sale. Life insurance is an emotional sale. Johnny, what are you going to do? If God forbid something happens to you, you have a wife, you have three kids, your wife only makes 40 grand, you make 150 a year, she can't survive on her 40. What are you gonna do? Do you want your wife to rely on another man to take care of your kids and be forced to appease to the new man's rules? Or do you wanna make sure that she dictates what the family rules are gonna be based on the way you left your family behind? And he's like, and she thinks about another man that she could possibly marry. He says, oh, hell no. I need a $1 million life insurance policy. That's an emotional, right? So the life insurance industry is not gonna take a hit. So I'm going back and all I'm thinking about is the part of AI, you know, everything's gonna be affected by AI no matter what, but it'll be case by case, and you have to sit there and think about it yourself within your industry and say, how is this thing gonna be hit by robots and AI? And, and if it is, you better get your adapting muscle ready, because things are gonna adjust. On the flip side of it, for the people that are opportunistic, it's a great time to become a billionaire. There's many ways to become a billionaire right now. Mm-hmm. If there's a time that you can make millions, hundreds of millions, billions, the next 10 or 20 years, mm-hmm. it's gonna be the best time ever where someone's gonna pop out with some idea that's gonna be picked up by somebody and say, I'll pay $1.8 billion for that, my name is Google. I'll pay you $600 million, my name is Facebook. I'll pay you $800 million, my name is Jeff Bezos. I'll pay you this much money, my name is Walmart. It's a very good time to be an innovator today, very. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much to be able to build with the new infrastructures in place. And the more degrees of freedom that pop in places like Africa, the more of these beautiful innovations that we're gonna start seeing around the world. And it's gonna go from 1,500 billionaires to 3,000 in the blink of an eye. Oh, no doubt about and, it. <laughs> and what are they gonna build? And hindsight's always gonna be 2020. We're gonna be like, I, I, I thought, I knew that that would be, that that would have been a good idea. So yeah, be that, be the person that innovates, go and build into the world. You guys always know that we're, we're talking about that with a lot of, of intensity, as do you, which is one of the reasons why I love you so much. You talk about building and creating with so much intensity. You even take this to PHP, you were starting talking about your agency a little bit. I found it so interesting that the agency itself has a very strong footing in helping the your individual financial services, um, the, the service here, the, the, the individuals that are that are the your agents are not only agents of the financial services and educating customers, but they're also working on their own individual brands and in that you guys help teach them how to do that. That is the new age. Mm-hmm. I love that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, uh, 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 so so for me, I was coming up in this company, and they said, you can't uh, build your own brand on Facebook or YouTube. You have to befriend me. Befriend me. You have to do this, and you have to. I'm like, wait a minute. What do you mean I can't do that? And then I sat there and I said, my gosh, this is how other people are going to feel if they want to build a brand. I am too confined. And what if you get the Tasmanian devil? You think you can really confine? and control the Tasmanian devil, there's no way in the world. He's gotta go out there and figure himself out. And sometimes he's gonna break a few things, but it's a person like that that's gonna be able to take you to a whole different level. I said, we're gonna embrace it. So what we did is we came out with a system. Like we would sit down with one of our guys and we have one guy named Matt Sapala, money smart guy, if you look up his handle. And he's a Marine, eight years in the Marines. He served war all over the place. He's got incredible stories. But then he had his own TV show on finance in Chicago, he would go on panels, he was always on WGN with him and Chris Gardner, because Chris Gardner from Pursuit of Happiness, he's also a Chicago guy, and they would go out there and talk about different kinds of things. 
So he and I were introduced to each other by Dudley Rutherford, a pastor, and uh, we connected. And he says, hey, you guys got to talk. He's Filipino, you're Middle Eastern, you guys are like brothers from, you know, different mothers, right? And I said, okay, let's get, let's talk. Then we connected. Then I said, listen, man, why don't you brand yourself as the veteran entrepreneur? He says, what do you mean? I said, there's 31 million veterans in America, some active, some inactive. They need help. You're going to speak their language. This is out of 330 million people. 31 million is 9.5%. It's a big population. So he did. Next thing you know, he has all these different events that he's doing with military folks, veterans. He's being contacted by the Marines, by Air Force, by Navy, by Army. He's doing so much work for the veterans. And he's making a seven-figure year income. He's been with us for three years. In the first three years, we paid him $2.7 million. That's not bad. But our focus became, selfishly, what brand do you want to build? What is yes. your cause? What is your crusade? Yes. Let's help you get doing that. And on top of that, you build a business. Today, you got two brands you're building, your business and your personal brand. you got to make sure you do both today. Yes. Yes. And... I want to see if we can uh, see the transition with, like you were just describing, the you're building a personal brand, you're building a business brand, you're doing those at the same time. Um, you yourself are, the people that work with you are, you're inspiring them to. Now people from around the world are starting to do that. What are your thoughts about the current state of the geopolitical climate? Because there is a lot going on around the world, economically, politically, the way that commodities are moved around the world, the, the way that exponential technologies are coming forth. What do you see as going on today that is really important to keep an eye on? I, I think, you know, the, the whole saying of, uh, I just don't pay attention to politics, it's, it's too dirty. You know, I, I just don't want to deal with politics. Maybe you could have said that 30 years ago. Can't say that today. You cannot say that today you have to pay attention to politics today. And by the way, this is not a, you know, a democratic message or Republican message or independent libertarian message. This is just a self-aware, this is a being aware of what's going on in the marketplace message. Because uh, I heard a quote one time, it was, I think it was by Plato that said, those who believe it's foolish to study politics will be led and ruled by those who do, okay? So mm -hmm. remember, those who believe it's foolish to study politics will be led by fools who do. So if you don't study what's going on in the marketplace, you're gonna be led by somebody else who does. So what's my mm -hmm. feedback to you? How do you handle it? You gotta subscribe to three, four different uh, 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 writers, sites. I like Business Insider, there's certain things I like. And you gotta subscribe to both someone on the Democratic side and you gotta subscribe to someone on the Republican side. Anytime Trump does something right, and oh my gosh, and Fox News like, oh look what Trump is, maybe the greatest president of all time. I go straight to MSNBC and CNN. Anytime, anytime CNN and MSNBC is saying something about, look at Barack Obama, he's the greatest president of all time, I go straight to Fox News. I balance those two out. If I go to someone's home and they say, we never watch Fox News, you have blind spots. You have blind spots. You have blind so spots. Right. And if I go to someone's house and they say, we never watch CNN, now you know that's fake news, you have blind, blind spots. So this isn't the idea, like for me, I, I read uh, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto and I read yeah. Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. But I think for some people that say, I would never read Atlas, at somebody that said, I would never read Atlas Shrugged. That Anne Rand selfish, B-I-T-C-H, I can't believe she is this. And I had some people that say, I would never read Rules for Radicals and Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Why would I ever do that? Now you got, you got to make sure you read them all to be able to have your blind spots being covered because you're like, okay, this guy says that capitalism works because of this, but, but Karl Marx says capitalism doesn't work because you become so competitive in the marketplace that you forget about your family. And so this is why it's better for us all to be at the same level. I don't know if I agree with this, but maybe he's got a good point with the family. So I don't know if I agree with, you have to come up with your own stuff as you're doing this. But a lot of times you'll see someone that's politically left because their parents were left and their grandparents were left. Well, then that's your, your blind spots. You know, and you know, for me, my mother's uh, side, they were communists. They all believed in communism. I mean, they're from Baku. Your family's from Baku. And they escaped from Baku, and they went to Caspian Sea. Through Caspian Sea, they went to a place called Bandar Pahlavi, Rasht. It's no longer called Bandar Pahlavi after the regime changed. But they lived there. But they still had some ties to communistic society. They liked it. It was warm. It was fuzzy. My dad believed in imperialism, the Shah. Today, I have one of Shah's former soldiers that's coming here to visit with me who became a special forces in the U.S. He was the first Muslim special forces soldier in the U.S. Army. 
and he went back to Iran to help out with Jimmy Carter while the whole you know, embassy was being attacked. And I want to know, hear his story. But you got to listen to both perspectives. So going back to geopolitical and what to do with it, man, stay as in touch as possible. I was in London last week, and I went and sat down with three different types of people, all different personalities and beliefs politically, because I want to know what's going on in Brexit. How is Brexit affecting? You know, you got 28 nations that are part of EU. One wants to come out, and Britain wants to be their own deal. And they got voted for, but they're trying to fight back, and they're trying to get them back in the EU. And the EU's way of selling the message is, well, you know, if you're part of the EU, we are officially the third largest military in the world if we all come together. But then folks in Britain are complaining, yeah, but it's the higher economies that are taking care of people like Greece who are not that discipline, and it's like, kind of like socialism is what EU is. The, the ones that are doing it right are taking care of the people that are screwing around. I don't want to be a part of it now. There's seven other nations want to leave it. How does that impact Europe? Could there be a war? Is it a good thing? What benefits is there? I want to know. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's important to realize I don't, I don't know all the things that are going on. Obviously, what's going on with the tariffs in China? How is that going to affect the economy? Is the negotiation going to affect us negatively, positively? March 1st, 2019 is a big day mm -hmm. because we're going to find out if that day is going to happen or it's not going to happen. Uh, so you got to somehow stay connected. And I think if you do, again, staying connected to geopolitical, paying attention to industries that are changing and what regulations are changing allows you to adapt faster. And whoever adapts faster has an edge over those that adapt slower. If you adapt too slow, well, you're going to be, you know, predicated based on what everybody else does, then you do what they do. But if you're able to adapt fast based on information that you have and the trends that you're studying, I think you have a big edge. So I, I, my, my biggest thing has always been just pay attention to politics. I know you don't like it. I know it's ugly. Just pay attention to it a little bit more than you're doing. Yeah. I, uh, this actually looped us all the way back to developing out that mental lattice and having it be as multidisciplinary as possible, seeing the beauty in different styles of people and how they've evolved into our world. Okay, a couple power round thoughts on the way out. Patrick, what do you think exists outside as, of us as a higher power? <clears throat> Got it. So you're talking about like a God, like you're talking about something, a higher power. That's the direction you're going. Yeah, and what, what potentially even exists outside the 3D reality that we Got live it. in. You know, uh, 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 um, I read a book the other day that talks about, you know, uh, sometimes you have to figure out a way to get disconnected with everything you know to tap into possibilities that are not necessarily there because you've been conditioned to think in a certain way. So you have to disconnect to be able to go a little loose. And this is a community that says maybe it makes sense to do shrooms and all these other, there really is a community <laughs> yeah. that talks about that. I don't Absolutely. know if you read yeah, about we, it. We've had Rick Doblin, the executive oh. director of uh, MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Sciences and Studies, and that is a huge way to, um, to eradicate traumas from PTSD and a lot of other really important Very interesting. Yeah. And by the way, they have research to show, like, I'm not of that school, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that, didn't want to touch drugs. I'm the guy that didn't like it. I'm, I'm not saying I didn't do a couple of things to try them out, but I was always like trying to fi figure out control. I don't want to be controlled by drugs. But you know, higher law. Okay, let's talk about that. Um, look, no matter what's out there, no one knows 100% what's out there. The atheist could be wrong or right. The agnostic could be right or wrong. The Christian, the Catholic, the Baha'i, the Muslim, the seven day, the Scientologist, every one of them is either gonna be right or wrong, right? So for me, back in um, 2002, 2004, five, I went on a journey. I said, I just wanna find out about all these religions. So I went to Scientology, and I started studying Scientology, Dianetics, because I had a lot of Scientologists around me. Then I went to Catholics, and I wanted to study what made Catholics so special. Well, I realized they're more about rituals, and their rituals is incredible on what they've done. Then I went and studied Mormonism, LDS Joseph Smith. What is this whole thing with Book of Moroni and how he started in Vermont and he found these special plates and they started going different places and then finally in Utah is where they stayed and they figured that was a place for them to start their religion. So Brigham Young is the guy that's moving it around. Jehovah's Witness, why do they believe in what they believe in? Why don't they celebrate birthdays and Christmas? Why is it that they think what they think? Seven-day Adventists. So their thinking simply was a Saturday, not a Sunday. So that's the biggest disconnect. So Muslim, what, what is the Muslim? You know, what is the difference between Islam and Muslim? And 
book of Quran and this whole thing you read about, you know, Muhammad, you know, was he a good man? Was he not a good man? Why is he, the criticism here? Why is Solomon Rush just saying what he's saying? So I went through this whole period, because I was an atheist 25 years of my life. I didn't believe in God. I went to church and I would always get kicked out of Bible study in Iran. I said, you mean to tell me there's a God and we just got bombed and 200 people died and you want me to believe there's a God? If there was a God, he's strong enough to hold the bomb and not let it drop off. So that's the conflict, right? Why is it that good people die? Why is a six-year-old kid that hasn't experienced life yet all of a sudden get cancer and, and she dies in the arms of her mother? No mother should be holding a six-year-old daughter in her arms and losing it. That's a very emotional pain that she's probably going to experience for the rest of her life to overcome that. That's like 60 years of pain you just gave to a human being. I don't know. If, so I struggled with it a lot. Mm -hmm. And then eventually for me, it came to uh, uh, seriously a bet. Like you have to uh, bet on something and say that's, that's where I'm going. And I could still be wrong. So I bet on that there is a God. Uh, to me, there's uh, too many weird situations that there isn't. There isn't. I'll give you a weird story here, very weird story mm -hmm. here. I got out of the army, and I'm dating a woman. It's a love of my life. She's from Baku. Mm -hmm. I was telling you about her earlier. And we're in the car. We've been together for three years. I'm in the worst position of my life. I'm broke, $49,000 of debt. I have nothing going on in my life. And I want to be with this girl, but I can't afford to do anything. I mean, I can't afford to take her to movies. And we're at Universal Studios City Walk. We're upstairs in a parking lot. She gets in a car. She lives in her Integra, Black Integra. And I'm on my Black Expedition. And I'm sitting there. I got out of the Army. I haven't spoken to my mom for five years. I have a new phone. She doesn't know my phone number. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay? And I'm sitting there and I say, you know what, God? I'm crying like a baby. I said, God, I don't believe you exist. I don't believe you exist. But if you do, I want to hear my mom's voice right now. It's like a, just a child wanted to hear his mom's voice. When I tell you 30 seconds later my phone rang with a block number, I was so scared to answer the phone. So scared to answer the phone, okay? So I had one of those Nextel walkie-talkie phones, you know, the ones that you would go like this back in the days, and I answered the phone, and it's her crying. I said, why are you crying? And I'm crying, but she cried first. I'm like, why are you crying? She says, because God told me you were in pain. I had to call you. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Come on. And like, I just got the chills out of my body because I get scared every time this happens. Like for me, it's like that real. <clears throat> and I said, what do you mean? How'd you get my number? Well, I've had your number for the last six months. I just didn't want to call you. She was upset I joined the army. And I said, um, I'm just like, I can't even talk. So what's going on? I can't even, I can't even tell her what I'm experiencing in that moment. Because it wasn't about her at that time. It was like, a supernatural, I'm not the guy that smokes weed or does any of that stuff. And so also I'm like, what the hell is going on here? This could be real. Like, is there really a higher power? Is somebody really listening to me? And if it is, what is the potential of what I can do with this person that listens to me that's a higher power? And then from there it took me, you know, when you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, sometimes when people that are close of dying, but they don't die, they believe there's a destiny tied to them. Like, you're supposed to do something. Is this a mathematical formula? Like, am I destined? I feel like God's using me in a way to do something big with my life. Mm. But what is it? What is the mm. purpose? How come I don't know yet? Why aren't you telling me? So that's the battle. So till today, I am not the guy that goes around baptizing people. I'm the guy that's full of doubt and uh, questions and Virgin Mary. And I've sat down and I've gone through all these prophecies. And how is that even possible? And But 2,000 years prior to that, there was another religion that used the same formula. So is it real? Is it not real? How can that happen? That can't happen scientifically. It's happened before. So why is it such a big deal for you to believe this and not believe this? So all of these things combined together um, got me to finally say, I think there is. I just don't know 100%. So I think there is a God. And uh, I'm putting my bet that there is. Mm. And piggybacking on that, do you think that this is a simulation? <sighs> I have no idea, man. But it's okay if it is. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I am very comfortable if it is. I'm very comfortable if that is what's taking place. Um, there's one thing that I don't have any desire to be. Zero. And I think that's the problem sometimes. There are a lot of people that want to be God. I have zero desire mm -hmm. to be God. And it makes me what that means to me. I want to know. I'm curious. I want to learn a lot. But I don't want to be God because if I aspire to want to be like some religion sell you on, if you move up these points and you become a 23, 
You'll become your own God, and one day when you die, you have your own universe. You would never convince me to get baptized in that religion. So I don't aspire to want to be God. I don't care to be God. I don't want to be God. So if that is happening, I am very okay playing that role. And I'm going to do my best to be a good character in that movie. Let's just say that is taking place. Um, you know, but uh, for me, it's more about controlled decision-making process that increases my odds of putting myself in the right position to make impact. And if I do yes, that right, that's I'm right. good with that. Last question. What do yeah. you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? People, man. Yeah. People. It's the most beautiful thing. It's, it's the most beautiful thing. I love that. Uh, so for me... I intentionally like to sit with people I disagree with yeah. because I want to get their perspective. Yes. I want to learn from them. It's very easy to only sit with people you agree with. That's an easy conversation, but it's yeah. sitting with people that you disagree with their decision and say, how did you get to that point? Yes. I think I learned more like that. But yeah, people is the most beautiful product in the world. I love it, Patrick. This has been so, so enriching across a bunch of different ways of perception. And this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining Anytime. us on the thank show. Thank you. Appreciate Such you for pleasure. having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Also, go and check out Patrick's links in the bio below. Go and check all that out. Go and follow Valuetainment and go and start checking out the channel. Also, Go and build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Bring your calling forth. We love you so much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Take care.